actually really appropriate because Junie gave the longest interview and a lot of the themes that Tamashi Jackson pulled together, they started in that, that interview. So I'll turn it over to you. Um, Junie, make sure you speak into the microphone and let me know when you want to advance the slides. Okay. I can stand, I'm sure. Well, thank you. Or you can come here if you want. Either um, way. I'm okay here. Am I okay here? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, of course, this is my lovely wife, Kara Conklin Wingfield. And uh, I just certainly want to recognize her for all the work that she's done. And especially with being able to, sometimes I've always called it being the consciousness, the social consciousness of the Paris Art, the Paris Art Museum. Thank you. I'm going to need that. I'm going to need that when I drop it because I'm known to be able to tell you what, who made the watch if you ask me what time it is without a mic, okay? <laughs> so I wanna do that. So um, I do wanna say, I wanna open with this. Um, in my life, um, the greatest literary figure that I know is Zora Neale Hurston. And I'm gonna speak it just like she said it. I think us here to wonder myself, to wonder, to ask, and then in wondering about the big things and asking about the big things you learn about little ones almost by accident. The more I wonder, the more I love. And I'm hoping that when we leave here tonight, I will leave you wondering because that's what this whole experience continued to be for me with Tamashi. I wonder, and I constantly have wondered, that's my grandma and my grandpa back there. That's Waverly Washington Wingfield and Beaner Ann Wingfield. Incredibly strong names, I must say. Waverly Washington Wingfield and Beaner Ann Wingfield. Arrived here around 1920. Established the First Baptist Church on Halsey Avenue, the first church in the community. They had six daughters, two incredibly amazing sons, and these are the daughters, absent my mother, Mahalia. And these daughters and these women, majestic and proud, constantly made me wonder how in the world were they able to continue to provide for us and our families, knowing that they would constantly have to make sure we understood that we were not, we were not poor we were just experiencing poverty. And why? Because they taught us that was temporary. My aunties there also taught us that we want to reach for the sun. She knew, they knew that we may not reach the sun, but they knew one thing, by constantly reinforcing that for us, we would certainly get off the ground. And get off the ground, we did. But also the ground, this museum right here, which was a farm field, these aunties pick potatoes in this field. And I was wondering sometimes, you know, what was that about that they would have to pick these potatoes? And right next door, for those who came in, where you see the beautiful vineyard, that was a chicken farm. That was a Malone chicken farm. And so they picked the potatoes. And you know, my Aunt Blanche, who sits right there in the middle, which at that point, she's now blind, her eyes are really on God, so don't worry, your look isn't just about being blind. It's those aunties right there who bombed these fields. And of those aunties, my two on the right are still living. My Aunt Louise has died, my Aunt Blanche has died, my mother has died, my Aunt Alice has died. And they all died of cancer, picking potatoes. Charm and challenge, picking potatoes. The farmer needed to what? Kill that golden nematode, better known as the potato bug, get it to market. The more they increased the level of the pesticide, the more difficult it became for what? To kill the potato bug because they became immune. So a part of the tragedy, a part of the whole thing for me was constantly wondering, wondering how every day they would come home still with such magnificent attitudes, raising us, giving us love, courage, being majestic, and then still knowing that not only were they going to go to school, they weren't coming home like other little kids, they were coming home to pick potatoes. 
again, another slide. With all that being said, they were all working to make sure that we would have the most liberating force in the world. And who were we? I'm third oldest of almost 29 grandchildren. So they had a lot of babies. And so they always knew that the opportunity for us was to go to college. And so I too became a first generation college student. During that time, I was able to serve in Vietnam, uh, thank God, come home alive. And then the story goes, I still wanted to make sure I could honor everything that they had worked for, everything that they had hoped for, everything they had dreamed for, which was how could I now come back and be an object for change, to be someone who would not liberate myself from the community, but to help liberate the community. I was 22 years old, and I ended up with a $10,000 grant, Old Fairlane Ford, and a file box. And I was able to parlay it into a large sum of money at that time, which allowed us to create an organization called Southport Council for Children and Youth on David White's Lane. If you go to David White's Lane now, it's a daycare center. And we still have that property and I still have a dream, something else that we're talking about for that property. But the real thing was, even in Tamashi's uh, uh, ex exhibition, you can see that uh, educational excess became very, very important for us. So through that building, and we, the building was an old building that was used as a migrant camp. And the building was being used to house, and the migrants at that time were other young men and women coming from Florida to work in some of the businesses. So I ended up with this little grant and getting a little space on Main Street and the program was growing and they no longer wanted me on Main Street so they gave us an opportunity to buy a building. We created an agency called Southport Council for Children and Youth. Existed for 14 years and then we know what happened at that point. The Reaganomics took over, the trickle didn't trickle down, they were no longer, as they say, cutting into the fat. They were cutting into the lean. All the domestic programs tend to just fall by the wayside. All of the programs, from talent search, upward bound programs, they all just still disappeared. And the pendulum swung from domestic concern to military might. What a setback. On every level, what a setback. And in my effort, it was a collective effort because I want to say to my brothers and sisters on the reservation, my first employee there was Doreen Dennis and she was finishing at Stony Brook. And they allowed me to come into the center and we got college catalogs from every single college and university. And I was looking and standing on the shoulders of the giants then, this is Betty Cromwell, Mrs. Uh, Smith, Mrs. Harriet Gums. And they were all instrumental and helping me try to make that interconnectedness and give our kids educational access with this old building. Uh, next slide. Important in collective memory when Tomashi <laughs> came was my friend Odell Furby. And that was an important piece because for Odell and I, who were peers and friends all of our lives, we walked throughout the entire community. And there wasn't a house that we didn't stand in front of that we didn't have a memory and we didn't wonder. Wonder what would it have been like if so-and-so would have had more opportunity. Wonder what it would have been like if they didn't have to face all the redlining in real estate, all the redlining in bike banking. Wondering what it would have been like if they could have taken all of that creative genius that they brought from the South, the ability to teach irrigation, the ability to teach the farmers how to farm, the ability to teach masons how to lay brick and how builders and carpenters how to build homes. Wondering how it would have been if they had the opportunity to use that and create their own businesses. Odell and I walked and we walked and we walked with Tamashi's friend and we told these stories, sometimes crying, because it broke our heart, but it also made us do what? Feel more love than we could ever imagine because we could feel the strength and the capacity to endure that was in those moments. Next slide, Karen. Randy's Barbershop, as you all know now as Sammy, Southampton African American Museum, was an incredible, incredible place. 
Uh, it was an incredible place because that interconnectedness of community, that whole thing about telling stories, that whole thing about this man named Randy, who would also not just sit there and cut hair, but he would constantly be trying to talk to each and every person who came in to his shop, man, woman, or child, about what their needs were, what their expectations were in the community, how they had to find strength, and most of all, how freedom wasn't free. You had to fight for it, and inclusion would be up to you. And he constantly would remind us of that, that inclusion will be up to you. If you sit around and wait for someone to give it, then guess what? You'll just be sitting there, you'll be left waiting. So Sammy now is this wonderful place. What I do want to say, as much as we talk about Randy, one of the most memorable things for me about this place is on the right side was the beauty parlor. These incredible, magnificent, phenomenal, as Maya Angela would say, phenomenal women. Phenomenal women. And oftentimes, I think that for me, I still feel like we're not telling that story enough because it is within their strength that so many things in our community were being able to get done by so many of the incredible, incredible women in that Bob, uh, beauty parlor. And on the other side, you know, every now and then I hear a little noise, a little beep, and then I realize what it was is that that hot comb had hit someone's neck, okay? And it took me a long time to wonder what was going on with that, okay? But that was, again, part of the beautiful stories, and they were all looking out one another and all looking out for us. One more slide. This is the last one. This is the last one, thank you. Um, that's just me wondering for sure. I'm standing in the back of the Johnson, Harrison Johnson residence, but what I'm standing in the middle of is to me what's the most beautiful garden as I was growing up in an entire community. And the interesting thing, Harrison Johnson worked for a farmer named Mr. Roscoe for years, and Mr. Roscoe was always known to have such incredibly wonderful crop, I knew it was because of this man, Mr. Johnson. And the testimony to it was when you could see his garden, when you could see the things that he was growing, when you could see how he had been able to know that the earth itself was so telling and so meaningful, and he would teach us that, and he would let us come out in his yard and come through his garden and make sure, don't step on anything, Okay, but it was such a wonderful, wonderful journey. So I stood in that garden and I wondered too. I wondered when Mr. Charlton Falsey, whom he also worked as a farmer, came to me and said, can we create a scholarship maybe for some of the children of the farmers? And why Mr. Charlton? He says, because those men worked themselves to death for me. My wife and I, we comfortably retired to Florida and we sit on the porch and look at the sunset and we think about Harrison Johnson, Joe Johnson, uh, Bonnie and Michelle's uh, uh, grandpa, grandmas, everyone. And we wonder, you know, is there anything that we could do to show that we do understand that on our behalf, they literally worked themselves to death because a lot of those men were younger than Mr. Halsey, like my aunties were when they were farming and taking care of that land. But again, with all of that being said, in that wondering for me, no, no regrets. It just makes me just love, love the idea that we have to continue to fight and make those individual children that we fought for understand that they should take nothing for granted. So I love you. Thank you so much. Thank you.